evening. We have a truly global audience today. My name is Eric Berglov. I'm the director of the Institute of Global Affairs at the LSE School of Public Policy. This webinar is part of a series uh, the IDA is organizing on COVID-19 and early lessons from the pandemic. We're delighted to be organizing this particular event uh, with the LSE Middle East Center and the School of Public Policy at LSE. We are meeting at a time when the epicenter of the academic has traveled from China uh, and via Europe to the United States. But the pandemic has not yet taken hold in the emerging and developing world, including in the North Africa and the Middle East. But it's about to do so. And it does so, we are likely to see both infection rates and death rates go up dramatically. And the economic impact is also likely to be much worse. In fact, many countries, particularly those which are most connected to the world economy, are already experiencing the economic impact even before the virus has taken hold. Collapsing commodity prices, particularly the oil prices, falling tourism revenues, dropping remittances and massive capital outflows are already wreaking havoc in these economies. This is certainly true for North Africa and the Middle East. This will come to a region already under tremendous pressure from a lack of competitiveness and diversified economies, limited state capacities in many countries, and large cohorts of young people dissatisfied with the current social contracts in many, if not all, countries in the region. And it's now hit by an intertwined medical emergency and economic crisis. Both need to be addressed urgently, but we need to make sure that the medical problem gets sufficient attention. Without the solution to the medical problem, we won't be able to return the economy to where it was, let alone implement the reform necessary to make these economies more competitive and provide meaningful and sustainable jobs for young people. But the economic impact is also weakening these countries' capacity to respond to the medical emergency. And, and social contracts will have to be re rewritten throughout the region. It will certainly be true in the Gulf countries, but also in North Africa, where they already have been challenged for a decade or more. We see political protests coming back in the infected in some states like Lebanon and Iraq. Key conflict zones, Syria, Yemen, and Lib Libya will also be affected in a dramatic way. And they have very little possibilities to prepare and capacity to cope with a medical emergency. And we have now seen the first cases in, in these places. The ultimate nightmare is, of course, that the virus also gets traction in refugee camps where social distancing and, and the like are often impossible. With the closure of borders, there's nowhere to go, and there's a big risk that the frustrations of people will be directed at refugees. We already see examples of this. Of course, this is a challenge to which the governments and regional organizations must respond, but it's also a unique opportunity and responsibility for Europe to show that it can deliver. Europe must show that it can deliver as a system coordinating efforts of bilateral agencies and development banks, the international multilateral institutions, as well as the EU level institutions. We must use these institutions to make sure that the support reaches those most vulnerable and most in need. We can also use them to reduce the impact on small and medium sized companies and help sustain jobs in larger companies that are clients with these institutions. We're going to discuss these issues uh, in this panel today. We have a fantastic group of panelists today who are going to help us take stock of where we are and, and in terms of um, thinking about uh, the response in the region. I'm going to introduce them as uh, I invite them to speak. We have a very large number of people on today's call and I ask you to mute your phones and if you're not speaking and, and also uh, if you can turn off, off the camera so that it's, a, uh, it's also a better uh, for those who are watching this uh, from on our Facebook page. If you want to ask questions, uh, you can use the raise your hand function in Zoom or you can place a question in the chat room. Please introduce yourself and your affiliation when asking questions and keep them short. We'll try to keep track on this uh, during the call. Please um, uh, bear with us. So our first speaker is uh, Melanie Kamet. She's a professor 
in the government department at Harvard and chair of the Academy of International and Area Studies at Harvard. She also has an appointment um, in the medical school at Harvard. She's focused uh, on the provision of welfare uh, by public, private, and non-state actors in the Middle East. And I guess this topic could not be more relevant um, uh, today. So please, Melanie, the, the virtual floor is yours, please. Great, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this topic is obviously of vital importance. It's also a moving target because every day we get more and more information about what's going on and on the nature of the disease. Um, so I want to say just a few general words about what shapes the ability of countries to contain the coronavirus uh, and then talk more specifically about um, how this has played out in the Middle East. And if there's time or during the q and I can talk about specific country responses. Um, and, you know, broadly speaking, we can divide responses to the virus to those factors that relate to state, the state, um, state actions, and those that pertain to societal characteristics and behavior. Um, and with regard to the state, I'm talking about government strategy and state capacity and factors that affect those things. And with regard to society, I'm talking about structural features of the socioeconomic characteristics um, like inequality or poverty rates, as well as factors that affect social compliance with directives to contain public health threats. So, um, so there are some general things uh, we can say about state and societal characteristics in the Middle East and North Africa that affect the formulation and implementation of public health uh, measures, such as reporting, testing, instituting and enforcing social distancing, as well as, of course, compliance with public health measures. Uh, so uh, concerning state-related factors, um, there's obviously a tremendous variety in the region, in the political economy of states in the region, uh, ranging from countries that have high levels of per capita oil rents, uh, largely in the Gulf, uh, those that have lower levels of per capita oil rents, many of which are actually the sites of ongoing conflict and violence, and then countries that have lower levels of oil rents and are lower GDPs per capita. So there's variation there. Uh, and I think, uh, as I mentioned, some countries in the region, and as you said in your introductory remarks, Eric, are uh, in the midst of war and political breakdown. And this, of course, creates special circumstances in trying to address the conflict. Here I'm thinking, of course, of Yemen, Syria, Libya. Um, and one of the political factors here is that these countries tend to have contested zones of authority with very different patterns of governance, uh, including governance related to security measures that are being deployed to ensure that people uh, comply with public health directives such as they exist by central authorities. So we see this in Yemen, for example, where Houthi controlled territories have very different governance structures than those that are uh, administered by the official government. Uh, related to this is the presence of refugee populations. As you said, these, speci these pose special challenges in that you have very dense living conditions that make physical distancing virtually impossible, limited access to sanitation and hygienic supplies, and also the health characteristics of refugee populations matter a lot. Uh, people tend to have weakened immune systems and are, have less access to healthcare to treat ongoing uh, health conditions. And the Syrian refugee crisis in particular has posed a challenge to the international humanitarian community because this is a country that had uh, higher levels of GDP per capita than many countries facing refugee crises that are the source of refugees. And uh, what this means is that you had higher than normal levels of non-communicable diseases in the Syrian refugee population. And non-communicable diseases require regular and consistent access to health care, uh, which is challenging in the context of refugee crises and is all the more challenging when you have overtaxed health systems trying to deal with the coronavirus. To our knowledge, uh, the, the pandemic has not yet exploded in refugee populations. This is surely in part because of inadequate testing. It's sure to be there. And we know 
the nature of this disease is that it manifests weeks after infection occurs. So this is definitely coming down the pike. Um, a few other general points I wanna make about state-related factors. Some Middle Eastern countries are highly aid dependent, and of course this applies to the most conflict-affected countries, but not exclusively. I mean, if we think of the case of Jordan, this is an extremely aid-dependent country as well. And uh, containment measures um, can disrupt aid supply and delivery chains. So this is a big concern for the international humanitarian community, and of course for states that are dependent on these aid flows. Um, another factor uh, related to the Middle East is authoritarianism. We know that this is a region that is disproportionately home to a large number of authoritarian regimes in global comparative perspective. And there's been a lot of attention recently to what this means for, uh, for governance and for the response to the pandemic, and particularly how autocrats are profiting from or may profit from the response to the pandemic. Um, so this gives them, you know, the perfect uh, reason to implement greater surveillance and control over populations and may have lasting effects after the pandemic is controlled. Uh, authoritarianism is also associated with the incentive to suppress information and greater capacities to suppress information as media is tightly controlled and whistleblowers are getting punished, especially because autocrats in this region are seem to be quite concerned with what we call performance legitimacy, with shoring up their credentials in terms of how they respond to economic crises and other things as a way to gain tacit uh, support from the population. So it is very much in their incentive to suppress the release of information about this virus and its spread and so forth. Uh, and then finally, I just want to say something about state capacity itself, which we know is absolutely vital for the public health response. And state capacity on the one hand involves material resources such as money and also health infrastructure, health facilities, equipment, um, personnel, and so forth. But it also entails less tangible factors like the ability to gather information, to regulate and coordinate supply chains, to regulate and or deliver services. Uh, and many countries in the, in the region, this is not unique to the Middle East and North Africa, this is true of many developing countries, have underdeveloped state capacity, which potentially complicates the response. They tend to have very developed state capacity in the security sector, but less developed capacity in welfare delivery and those areas. So security is relevant here in that security forces are being deployed across the region to ensure compliance with stay at home orders and physical distancing and so forth. Uh, so that does play a role, but there's other capacities that are absolutely vital and it's well documented that public health systems have been declining for decades in the region and uh, that the private nonprofit sector has been on the rise across the region. This is of course out of reach for much of the population, which is low income or below the poverty line. And of course the proportion of people in Middle Eastern societies that are below the poverty line is rising uh, with the economic crisis that preceded and is accompanying the pandemic. So I just wanna say a few more things on the other side of the equation related to societal factors. Um, in particular, inequality and poverty. And inequality is uh, obviously a, a, an important feature of this region. In cross-regional comparative perspective, it is often uh, said that the region is not the most unequal region in the world. Latin America is, seems to be home to the most unequal societies but it is very likely that inequality rates are underreported in the region for lack of access to data and perhaps even manipulation of data. Um, so, so that is likely. Uh, and inequality is associated with poor social safety nets. It is well known that societies with more protective social welfare regimes tend not to be so unequal and tend to be able to support their populations in the context of major public health crises. Um, also, we know from the, deter the social determinants of health literature in public health that the vulnerability of the poor 
um, uh, um, increases with inequality to public health threats. The poor are disproportionately um, vulnerable to uh, poor health, to inadequate access to health care, and so forth. And so this really matters in terms of how the pandemic is going to play out across the region. Uh, the poor also disproportionately tend to have underlying health threats, live in dense areas, uh, and cannot forego income, don't have the option of working from home and so forth. So this is a region that has rising poverty rates. Uh, it's also one, a region that has undergone what public health specialists call the epidemiological transition, um, whereby most morbidity and mortality comes from non-communicable diseases rather than communicable diseases. And this means that rates of diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and so forth are especially high uh, in this region. This is a true across the region, actually, not just in the lower income, but we know that the Gulf uh, wealthy countries also have high rates of these um, non-communicable diseases. And one thing that's clear about COVID-19 is that folks with these kinds of underlying health conditions are especially, especially vulnerable. Um, so, um, so, you know, social safety nets are underdeveloped. Um, this is perhaps less true in the wealthier countries for nationals, not as true for guest workers, especially uh, low-skilled guest workers, and this exacerbates inequality. The last um, set of points I want to make has to do with societal compliance with public health directives. So. Um, we are being asked across the world to make enormous sacrifices. And of course, the, the depth and impact of the sacrifice depends on socioeconomic status to a great degree. So people that have lower socioeconomic status are by far much harder hit than upper income people by the sacrifices we're being asked to make, by staying home, by not going to work, by physical distancing and so forth. And arguably, social compliance requires much more than coercion for people to, to obey. Um, so yes, you can achieve social compliance through repression, and that is definitely happening across the region. We see that the military and police forces are being rolled out in many, many countries across the region. There's checkpoints, there's uh, people being detained and so forth for not complying. Um, but that can only get you so far. Repression cannot uh, be the sole solution. We need citizen compliance as well. And this is complicated by two things. One is political trust. It's much easier to elicit citizen compliance with state directives when people trust their governments. And levels of political trust are quite low across the region. There's some variation cross-nationally in this, but it tends to be true across the board. Um, although, interestingly, when you break down state institutions, many people express higher levels of trust in the military and security forces than in government officials and parliaments and so forth. But in general, people have less political trust. They may be skeptical of the public health information that's coming out from official channels and so forth. The other element of trust is societal trust, which is really critical for social solidarity, and as many people have argued, I've argued this in a white paper for the Safra Center at Harvard with my colleague, Evan Lieberman, um, you need uh, societal trust, you need social solidarity in order to sustain uh, compliance with what is required to address this pandemic. This is especially true for COVID-19 because the groups that are least vulnerable and most likely to be the vectors spreading the disease are the young and healthy people, uh, and they tend to be uh, asymptomatic or less affected by the, by the disease uh, and, and spread it to um, older populations, more vulnerable populations. So to the extent that people feel more solidaristic with each other, it's easier to fight the coronavirus. Um, it's easier to make sacrifices for the greater good. So obviously in places that have more politicized social cleavages, it's harder to elicit this kind of broad compliance needed to contain the infection. Uh, and this is true uh, to varying degrees across the region where you have politicized divisions and so forth. 
Um, so we are likely to see that this will have profound effects on the Middle East and North Africa as it will have across other regions. You know, it's possible that the um, authoritarian consolidation that has occurred as a result of taking measures to boost uh, monitoring and surveillance of the population will have lasting effects, um, will provide further justification for this kind of authoritarian control in the region, and of course, uh, major lasting economic effects to an already vulnerable region that required a major overhaul of the economic model across many countries in the region. Um, I'll stop there, um, but I'm happy to talk about more specific country responses as well in the q and Thank you very much, Melanie, for a very elegant overview of, of the region and of the challenges that it faces uh, with this um, pandemic. Our next, speaker, spe our next speaker is Masoud Ahmed. Uh, Masoud is the president of the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., has a long career uh, as the director of the uh, Central Asia and Middle East Department in the IMF and in the World Bank, in DFID. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to have you here, Masoud, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. And uh, I think Melanie set the stage on one of the shocks that the region is dealing with right now and the vulnerabilities that many countries have that will make it harder to deal uh, with that uh, shock of uh, COVID. I think there are going to be two other parallel shocks that uh, countries are dealing with, which are more economic and related to it, uh, uh, to the COVID epidemic. The first, uh, of course, is the impact of uh, lower oil prices. and. Uh, the thing to remember about lower oil prices, uh, and, uh, Stefan may talk more about this, is that they, it's not just bad news for the oil exporting countries in varying degrees, but it's also, uh, in a somewhat counterintuitive way in the region, bad news for uh, the oil importing countries. Because even though they gain in terms of paying less for the oil that they import, they lose almost as much and sometimes uh, more uh, in terms of remittances uh, from the workers that they have in the oil exporting countries of the region, the rich countries. Uh, they lose in terms of uh, investment flows and, and uh, tourism from there. And of course, the third shock is the fact that uh, uh, not just uh, the uh, region, but the world is going to see a consequence of slowdown in global demand, a slowdown, in a cessation of tourism for a year, uh, of travel. And if you think of a, a city like Dubai or an emirate like Dubai, I mean, the whole of Dubai's uh, economic model is based on trade and tourism and being a hub for interaction with the rest of the world. And, you look at the number of Middle Eastern airlines uh, at the moment, uh, many of them are going to be facing some rather difficult times for years to come. So there are these three shocks that they are, the region are dealing with. And alongside that, uh, the other point I want to make uh, as, as, a, as a starter is, is uncertainty. Uncertainty about how long this uh, uh, epidemic will last, uncertainty about what is the best response, what is the balance between uh, lockdown and, and letting people come to work. We're having that debate here. Um, <clears throat> uncertainty about how effective uh, that kind of response would be. If you think about uh, Cairo or you think about uh, uh, Casablanca, think about Algiers and, and think how will you enforce social distancing and uh, the kind of stay at home uh, strategies that we are advocating here uh, and that we are actually in varying degrees uh, trying to implement uh, with uh, some success? Uh, how long can you have people do that? So the bottom line from this is that because of the uncertainty, because of the fact that whatever they do, leaders of these countries will find that by the end of the year, they will not have, they cannot succeed totally in the eyes of their populations. 
And so starting off with uh, varying and generally low levels of trust uh, in uh, their leadership in, in many of these countries, by the end of uh, 12 months, I would say that uh, social capital will have been eroded in, in many of these countries. And many of those leadership will find that it will be harder a year from now to get people to make sacrifices or to do things that uh, have a longer term perspective. And why does that matter so much? Uh, well, there's obviously the social disruption and the political consequences of that and others might want to talk more to that. But I think it also matters because we are very much focused on the next six months and the next 12 months right now. But this is an epidemic, this is a crisis that will have a very long shadow. Not just for the next 12 months, but for the next 36 months or the next 60 months, the three years or five years, the world will not be the same. And the prospects and opportunities facing households, businesses, and governments in this region will not be the same. If you're an oil exporting country, uh, you, most of the countries in the region have been saying now for at least a decade that we need to diversify our economies. We're less reliant on oil and start moving towards uh, other kinds of business. If you were to take stock and say how much real diversification has taken place. Well, diversification, you can set up industries, you can set up businesses, but as long as you are financing them and making them competitive by using oil rent, that is not effective self-sustaining diversification. The question really is, how much of the economy is going to be able to work and earn its way in the world competitively without the support of the oil rent that currently underpins a lot of profitability of a lot of these uh, businesses. And on that front, I would say that journey is really only in its early stages. And maybe one of the lessons that it'd be worth discussing is, can you truly diversify and build a competitive economy while maintaining in parallel the system of oil-based rents and the social contract that goes with it that has underpinned these uh, oil exporting countries for a while. And uh, some countries have enough money. Uh, you know, if you think about some of the GCC countries, uh, they have enough money to, 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 to do this gradually. You can do it in a decade, you can do it in two, even with these lower oil prices, you could take some time to get there, but others, don't have that much time and frankly now are running out of time if you think about the oil price trajectory going forward after this crisis. So if you look just a little bit further south from where you're sitting, uh, Eric, which is uh, look at Algeria, you know, a country that uh, uh, is just on the borders of Europe and where unemployment has been a huge issue for a long time, uh, where they have uh, now started to run through their reserves uh, and could run through them uh, in, in a matter of uh, three or four years, unless you begin to change the nature of uh, competitive uh, equilibrium in, in that economy. Uh, I think some countries, as I say, don't have that much uh, time to do that. And, and, and I could name you know, a few others, even in, in the Middle East, which have that same characteristic. So I, well, one topic which I want to leave you with, therefore, is you know, the longer term journey, of the oil-based economies, away from oil and towards a more diversified uh, economic structure, has become even more urgent now. And I think this, I don't wanna call it a wake-up call because I think people were already awake to it, but, but I think this is sort of like a jolt, you know, for policymakers to say, are we really going to get there? This is a race against time and that race is getting, that time is getting shorter and now is the moment to 
really reflect and see what are the kinds of changes we need in those in our in societies that are oil based to be able to truly become competitive and and then the the final point that i want to come to and uh, is really to talk not about the oil based economies but uh, the others you know the 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 what call them oil importing countries, call them emerging markets. I'm thinking of Egypt, uh, Jordan, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, and Lebanon you mentioned. And for these countries, they've been trying in varying degrees to uh, make economic uh, progress. They've been embarked on programs of uh, uh, economic reforms supported uh, in many instances by international institutions, uh, by the IMF, uh, by the World Bank, by the regional banks, by the European institutions. Uh, and I think they are finding that after a few years of these efforts, progress has been less than they had hoped for in terms of being able to demonstrate better outcomes to their population. And the appetite or willingness of their populations to continue with another few years of reforms is now very thin. And that's why you see some countries have attempted to move forward despite this uh, lack of popular uh, endorsement by using uh, increasingly repressive techniques uh, to, to move forward. Others have uh, slowed down their reform because they feel that going any faster uh, would risk social unrest. In the process, because they've been running budget deficits in many cases, they built up fairly high levels of public debt. Uh, and now they're getting to the point where their ability to access capital markets is quite limited and, and their ability to build up more debt has been limited. But along comes this period when for the next three years or five years, we're going to see uh, much slower growth in the world, much slower economic uh, demand for their exports, lower tourism, uh, and consequently, a lot of them are going to actually find that in 12 months time, having undertaken whatever little stimulus packages they can afford now, they're going to end up with more debt, uh, a worse economic outlook, a dissatisfied population, and we, the world, will come along and say, well, look, given where you are, you now need to really tighten your belt, reform, and, and deal with the world as it is. And I think we will find that it will be very hard to mobilize the political social consensus in these countries to undertake the kinds of reforms that, that we hope will lead to better outcomes, but really which in the, in the global environment in which they'll be operating may not lead to the better outcomes in terms of economic and social welfare that, that uh, uh, would have been the case in, in a better world. So I guess what I want to end with is the thought that, that not just these countries, but all their economic and political and social partners around the world, and I think of Europe, I think of the United States, I think of China, have to sit down and work through together is how can we come up over the next few months, even as we're dealing with the current crisis, with a, a program of cooperative actions that will ensure that beyond the crisis, these countries have a chance to get out of the hole in which they will be uh, finding themselves at the end of this 12 months and can undertake the sorts of measures with the kind of pace and the kind of support, financial, political, trade, that would enable them to uh, contain the social uh, discontent with which they will have to deal. And, and also to just bear in mind that the consequences of failing to do that 
will be consequences that will be born, not only within the borders of these countries, but they will spill over across to many of the trading and uh, political partners uh, that they have. So it is a common endeavor on which I think we will have to embark and it will mean breaking some of the rules. You know, in fighting a war, we have to stick close to our values, but we have to be prepared to discard the rules that operated in peacetime. And if this is a war, we need to recognize and remember, you know, what are our values and what are our rules? And the danger is that by sticking to our rules of how we lend money, what we do, how we operate, we end up actually betraying some of our values. So let me end with that and, and uh, be happy to pick up on questions. Thank you very much, Masood. And those remarks at the end is sort of summarizing, I think, what the world is, is facing more generally. But of course, it gets particularly, particularly um, uh, important in, in this region. And, and as you said, the, the close connections between North Africa, Middle East and, and Europe is maybe particularly important here. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Stefan Hertog, who is a colleague of mine at LSE, associate professor in the government department, and someone who's worked extensively on the political economy in the uh, Middle East and, and North Africa. So, Stefan, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, I was going to remark very quickly on how the oil exporters in the region are going to be affected, particularly picking up on some of the themes that uh, Masood has already alluded to, because those are the places that I know the best. But I also want to say then after that, some general things about the labor market implications of the crisis in the wider region, including in poorer countries, where there are very large uh, informal sectors, where I think we'll see a lot of the real uh, social pressure points. Um, so there, there, there are some qualified good news for the oil exporters in one sense at least in that uh, a lot of the citizens particularly in the high-rent countries so uh, the smaller countries with higher oil exports like Kuwait, Qatar and the UAE um, citizens there are so state dependent and uh, the majority of citizens who work uh, who have formal employment are employed by government that uh, for the time being shielded from the, the market risks from uh, you know, becoming unemployed, from losing their incomes. Uh, of course, this is, uh, you know, in the long run, this is a very significant fiscal problem. This very high dependence on state employment, but in the short run, it preserves quite a bit of the domestic demand from households and it shields citizens against the crisis. Uh, even in a place like Saudi Arabia, which, is, which has lower per capita oil revenues, a much larger population, something like two thirds of citizens who hold a job are working in, in the public sector. Uh, but that's really only, that's really the only piece of kind of qualified good news, and it's really something that you know, in the long run still is, uh, is really fiscally bad news. Um, what's uh, worse in the oil exporters than in normal economies and in, in tax-based uh, economies that are affected by COVID is that the revenue side shock, as Masood alluded to, is, is much, much more significant through the oil war and oil price war in combination with the collapse of something like a quarter of global oil demand the main source of government revenue of those countries has essentially collapsed. So that there's nothing comparable in terms of uh, a government revenue shock uh, for any other country in the rest of the world. Uh, and that means that uh, even for the very richest oil exporters, the sort of fiscal envelope to push stimulus is actually quite limited. And what they're doing instead is to reallocate some spending. Uh, actually, a lot of uh, line ministries in Oman, in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain have been told to cut their operation expenditure, to cut their development expenditure at a time when we would argue be needing stimulus. And instead, there's some more targeted spending than on uh, the health sector, on uh, specific support for, for smaller businesses that, that are affected by the crisis. But uh, there, there hasn't been any of the very strong counter uh, macro response that we've seen in, uh, in uh, non-oil advanced uh, tax countries in, in the West. Um, so the fiscal hit is much worse and uh, there's also a much more severe long-term fiscal problem in the sense that you might use some of those finite fiscal reserves that these countries have to re-stimulate the economy, especially once the 
lockdown uh, is is being wound down and um, the kind of consumer facing service sectors that are now shut by government decree are open again. Uh, but all that spending is essentially money down the drain. It's never going to be recovered. And the, the logic of that is quite different from, uh, say, Western economies that uh, temporarily operate below capacity and then they need a fiscal stimulus to get going again. And then you can actually recoup quite a bit of that spending through what's called a Keynes multiplier, through uh, uh, capturing the higher tax revenue that the additional growth generates. But that mechanism isn't there in oil exporters because tax systems are very, very underdeveloped, so you recapture very little of the growth that you generate. And also there's not really much of an autonomous growth path. Uh, economic activity in the private sector is by and large a function of state spending. So it's not a question of just you know, giving them an initial nudge and then the growth is going to be on an autonomous trajectory. Instead, you have to continue spending money that you're not going to get back. And that'll be a lot harder because after the crisis, no matter how long it lasts, uh, the, the kitty, the reserves of all those countries is going to be significantly smaller. Now, Kuwait, Qatar, the UAE, they'll be fine. You know, they'll have to eat into the sovereign wealth funds to some extent, uh, but they have reserves that'll tie them over probably still for, for decades, but all other oil exporters will have a much more uh, restricted uh, fiscal outlook after the crisis. And, and that means um, probably something like an L-shaped recovery. So there'll be probably permanently lower growth to some extent because the government, the fiscal uh, resources to stimulate the economy, that the economy, that even the most private parts of the private sector need, um, those reserves just won't be there. So I think it's, it's very bad news for, for long-term growth. There's some specific uh, threats in oil exporters that have uh, currency pegs, and we can perhaps take them up in the Q&A if anyone's interested in that. Uh, in the Gulf region, the first sort of domino to fall would probably be Oman because they're running rapidly out of central bank reserves and they might have to bend their peg to the dollar unless oil prices uh, recover very quickly in the uh, in the near term future within 2020 probably. Um, so that's uh, sort of the pretty gloomy picture for the oil exporters, even the richer ones. And of course, there are also um, labor market and humanitarian dimensions there in uh, the non-citizen labor sector. There's been quite a bit of reporting on this. I think Qatar is the only country that's tried to do anything to uh, fiscally support expat labor to at least pay partial grants to temporarily cover some of the salaries of foreign workers. I don't think that program has been taken up on a very large scale. In all other uh, countries, there are very large populations of people who are uh, unemployed, who are without income because there's no uh, unemployment assistance, unemployment insurance system for uh, for foreigners and who are either flown home or who uh, you know, live in very, very cramped situations uh, with uh, very, very small savings, uh, both being exposed to the COVID risk and being exposed to potentially abject poverty. So that's that's uh, a crisis that, that's also been building up across the region. Um, and I think there's a similar logic of uh, segmented uh, reactions to the crisis going on in the rest of the region in the sense that there are insiders that are relatively protected uh, and among those I would, uh, I would count uh, almost all the government employees also in the rest of the region because even in low oil countries the share of government workers is pretty high in the labor market compared to other countries on similar GDP per capita. So those are relatively sheltered but at the same time there are also very large informal labor markets uh, and those people are completely unprotected in, uh, in more than one sense. So um, again they have no social security systems to fall back on. They have only the most bare bones of social safety nets usually to fall back on. Uh, the uh, welfare systems of uh, most MENA countries are not geared to people outside of formal employment. So it's very kind of traditional, sort of Bismarckian uh, contribution-based social welfare systems that, that benefit insiders who've got formal employment and don't do anything for outsiders on the informal market. Um, they also live usually um, in, in very, very densely packed quarters. So we've seen some reporting on the informal quarters in, in Egypt and Cairo in particular, where the curfews are not adhered to, they, they can't be effectively adhered to because of the, the density of population there and uh, because of the fact that people live from hand to mouth and they just need, they need uh, ongoing income to, to maintain themselves. So there have been some attempts to create cash grant systems for those uh, excluded informal uh, workers. 
but in many countries, the administrative capacity to roll that out isn't sufficiently developed because the, the region came pretty late to the game when it comes to general non-contributory social safety net uh, tools like cash grants. Recently, the, the Egypt, I think, created a one-off cash grant of something like $33 uh, for everyone who applies, but to apply, you have to submit written material. Of course, a lot of the informal workers are illiterate. So quite often the, uh, the administrative infrastructure isn't there to reach out to those populations. And I think it's those um, informal workers that constitute a very large share of uh, the labor market population, the poor Middle Eastern countries that we should be most worried about. And that I think Western aid agencies and governments should think the most about, uh, both in terms of maintaining their basic livelihood uh, and also the risk they pose in terms of the wider spread of, uh, of COVID, given that uh, it's very difficult uh, on both logistical and humanitarian terms to, to impose a complete uh, lockdown on them. And of course, even if they don't adhere to the lockdown, their livelihood is in danger because uh, the economic activities in the informal sector indirectly also depend on what's going on in the informal sector. So if those slow down, uh, you know, customers stay away, and people practice social distancing, uh, then, then uh, those informal sectors will, will also suffer very uh, significantly. And I think as, as Masood uh, outlined rightly, uh, the fiscal capacity of the poorer countries to react to the crisis is, is very, very severely hamstrung. They, they were already heading for fiscal crisis, and again, in some cases, currency crisis uh, be, before COVID. Uh, and I think the point that Melanie made on uh, trust in government and trust in government institutions is, is quite pertinent here. Um, it, it could, in, in some ways, you could see this crisis as an opportunity to perhaps move to a new social contract that's not based on, on the current welfare model, which is very exclusive and distortionary, you know, based on government employment and based on benefits for, for sort of a labor aristocracy of formal insiders. But to move to a new dispensation, you really need a kind of trust in government that currently isn't there. And I, I really the only chance I see to move to a new social contract where you have perhaps a more comprehensive, though less generous welfare system that's universal, you know, that will also cover informal workers. I think the only way to get there is really with significant uh, temporary fiscal support from outside of the region. And then uh, you know, the, the global uh, reaction of international organizations of leading Western powers to the crisis outside of their own boundaries hasn't been particularly inspiring so far. So it's, perhaps that's not a huge amount, a uh, huge uh, ground for hope in that regard. Um, but I, I don't think that uh, the crisis can be effectively addressed. And certainly the, those countries can't be put on a, on a new trajectory of development with, without quite a bit of help from the outside because their, their resources are really exhausted at this point. So um, the, the scenario that we might be heading for is perhaps something like what Egypt has already gone through to some extent. So uh, currency devaluation, cuts in real incomes, high inflation, and then perhaps at some point uh, regaining a bit of economic competitiveness on the basis of you know, having devalued so far and having become so cheap as an investment or production uh, um, locale that uh, th those countries are competitive again, but it's really becoming competitive through pauperization, which obviously is not the kind of adjustment that we want to see, but it, it might be the path that, that we're generally headed for. So that sort of Egypt in the last few years might foretell uh, the story for uh, the rest of the region, including for some of the lower rent oil exporters. And I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank you very much, Stefan. And of course, this is a very sobering picture that you, you, you paint for, for, for these countries. Uh, the last speaker uh, is uh, Kharit Yanahi. Uh, Kharit is chair of, the, of Vision 3 and, uh, as you know, a very prominent advocate of, of um, reform in, in the region coming from Bahrain and, and um, uh, was part of forming the Arab Business Forum and, and the World Economic Forum. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Khalid, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, it's always bad to be the last one to speak because everybody else has said what you wanted to say. So I got to improvise. But before I start, I think with Melanie's point about the pandemic and how the certain countries have been um, dealing with it. I think just to give credit where it's due, uh, I'll just give a couple of numbers. These are numbers which are public numbers. 
we have 1,128 fatalities in the Arab world from Bahrain to Morocco. And we have 1.4 million tests. And actually it's more towards the second one. So 1.4 million tests, of which 1.25 is basically between UAE, Bahrain, Saudi, and Qatar. Those four countries basically have the majority of the tests. So both Bahrain and uh, UAE are actually above Mr. Trump's thing saying about per million, they are far ahead per million than United States will ever be with testing the way it's going. So just as a point of fairness to, to bring that through. But that being said, um, I think Stefan's points, which and, and me coming from that part of the world, um, it, it's, it's important actually to pick on that, is one point both Melanie and Stefan say it in different ways, is that basically the issue of the low labor guys who come to that part of the world. Now the majority, the majority of the cases you'll find now and going forward is gonna be basically these labor. The cheap labor, the guys who brought them in, whether it's in Bahrain, Saudi, Qatar, all the six countries, maybe Oman is the least of the six countries from that perspective. You'll find majority of the positive uh, you're gonna have is gonna be basically the labor. And the reason is simply because we all kept a blind eye on something that we are all aware of, the way these guys have been dealt with, putting seven or eight or nine or 10 people in one room. So from that perspective, that has created, and in this pandemic, that helped the issue to come out. Um, and of course, the, uh, the rest of the world was aware of that. Maybe Qatar got hammered one or, one or two times, basically because there were deals done between one state in that Gulf uh, with the United States or with Europe, whatever. So they got hit because of the 2022 issue and the way they dealt with the labors. It's just something that we need to be clear about, We're not to forget what happens afterwards. Now, coming back, I think this is part of the world where for the past eight years, and I come from that part of the world, actually, if you take it off the map, that, that place from Bahrain to Morocco, and you just take it out of the map, would the world change? I mean, would there be anything different in the world? I think the answer is definitely no. I mean, that, that part of the world is totally irrelevant to the world per se in terms of development, in terms of doing things, in terms of innovation. It is totally irrelevant. We might have seven... Uh, Nobel laureates, maybe two of them I would question big time in terms of giving them, uh, it was more political than anything else, but we don't have real people who have basically been effective in the past 80 years in that part of the world. And one reason is, is what Stefan said, and the other reason actually is what um, Masood said. Um, being in, if I look back in 1970, in 1970 we were 120 million uh, as Arabs, uh, or 127 million. Uh, today we are around 360 million. Uh, the Gulf we were around seven and a half. Today we are 58 million uh, in the Gulf in the GCC. So we actually moved around seven and a half times where we were. Majority of the people there are basically foreign labor or working there, and they are part of the 1.6 trillion uh, economy uh, of the Gulf. Uh, majority of it. If once if you slash that people out of it, the 1.6 trillion will be substantially much less than it is. Uh, so we need to take these things into consideration. And actually, when we look back into what Masoud said about oil producing countries are suffering because of this, that's for sure. And non oil producing countries are suffering. I would just add one thing from non oil producing countries. Uh, you mentioned the FDIs, you mentioned the remittances coming in because of oil prices going down. I would add a third thing, actually, a lot of the people who came out in the streets in December 2010 and January and February 2011, they would have loved actually looking back now saying that this pandemic should have been in 2009. Because if this pandemic was in 2009, then the cash which was used and utilized, substantial amount of cash until today, by using red herrings such as Muslim Brotherhood, such as whatever, such as sectarianism or whatever, as a cause of what happened, would not have been there because the cash, which is the important thing, is basically going down. So, so you cannot have that excess cash to play with. Uh, so th that's an important point to look at. Now, the Gulf, which is actually the, the epicenter of the cash going out in the past, say, 20 years. Uh, I'll come to the point Masoud mentioned about diversification, but there's been the cash coming out in the past 20 years. And if we look actually pre 
Now, in Stefan's point about the way going forward, I will go before in the past three years in the Gulf, across the board, all the six countries, it's been very clear that they wanted to move from rentier economy to a real economy. And the reason is simply because from economic reform perspective. So the only way they could do it is basically having taxes, taking away subsidies in order to create that economic reform. Uh, I'm, I'm using IMF's point because that's part of economic reform. And diversification it has not happened. Masoud is right. And one reason it has not happened is because fight can get away with things. Like we have a lot of industries in the Gulf where the gas, the natural gas, is basically subsidized substantially, which makes you, in reality, if it's given the right amount to the right price, you'd be very, very competitive. So you're losing by creating some industries that you have in the Gulf because it is really the subsidy so high that it does not make sense. In that perspective. So what, what's happening now in the Gulf is that already before COVID-19, we had a problem and the cash is basically squeezing down. What's happening in Egypt, Stephen's point is right, what they've done in the past uh, three years, but could they have done it without what Masoud was talking about, without the real remittances coming up from the Gulf, without substantial amount of money, which is FDI and what I would call non-FDI, to keep the system going as it is. Would they be surviving the way they survived? I think there's a big question mark that that would not be the case. Uh, so going in terms of where we are before this COVID-19, it's important to look at the GCC. They have, Stefan said it, but let me just put some numbers on it. It is IMF numbers that, and it was a report in uh, February, which came out. IMF made it very clear that there is not real diversification, no economic reform the trillion dollar worth of sovereign funds, let's call them, which are outside, okay, they will evaporate by 2034. This was pre-COVID-19. And that pre-COVID-19 was that the, these countries altogether, they had a deficit, a budget deficit of $105 billion. Now that budget deficit, as we said now, based on being very optimistic, that the second part of this year, the oil is gonna average around $35, that is going to be around anywhere between 250 billion to 300 billion. To add to it some additional stimuluses, because as Stephen said, the, the stimulus is going to be substantially much more than what you're going to deduct on the other side of current expenditure. Because it's only current expenditure that you're going to be basically getting, cutting it down in Saudi, Bahrain, and everywhere else, Oman. So it's not CapEx, it is uh, current accounts, sort of, it's going to be the current, current account that you're going to reduce. And the stimulus has been substantially much more. So we're looking at, if this is the case, and the morning after the night before, and now we are the night before, which is this COVID-19, on how we're going to get out of this. Of course, the longer it takes, the worse it is. The cash element is going to go substantially away. And one thing I might basically just add on to Stephen's point, that UAE, Kuwait, and Qatar can survive but unfortunately for the three of them, they cannot survive without Saudi surviving. So what's happening is that you gotta look at those six countries together. I mean, Oman, maybe next year, they have between now and end of next year, around $6 billion worth of commitments that they have to pay. Uh, I put my hands on my heart that they will get that paid because somebody will help them to pay it. Same thing with the Bahrain. You know, they will pay the debts simply because the others can't afford deep picking to the dollar. And they can't afford to have a problem because eventually they will get into trouble themselves, the other countries, the countries which are rich in terms of the funds which are outside. So I think that, that's an important point. What that means, if we take the IMF numbers into consideration, then the 2034 is coming actually around 2025 or 2026. So it's getting much closer that the the day, the mayhem, which is going to really hit these guys, is going to get closer and closer. We have, to think, let me just add to this, that we've spent so much, when we look at the budgetary of the, the Gulf countries, and Algeria being one, the amount of money which has been put into security and armory is, un, is so high that it's not been used in the right direction. How much of that money that we've spent over the past 10 years on arms, okay, of course the US, the Russians, the British, the French, the Germans, 
the Chinese, everybody's happy because they're getting that money, but how much of that arms has been used to defend the countries? I mean, I think nobody said it better than, and I love Mr. Trump, because he says it as it is, okay? He says, we are on, we're only gonna be in Syria where the oil is. We're not gonna be in Syria where there's no oil. I told the king without my military, he will not survive. I mean, I love that because he actually is bringing it to earth. He's bringing the thing, which is reality, is bringing it to earth. So the amount of money has been spent on arms, so much, which has been wasted, rather than developing the countries, rather than creating a meritocratic uh, base of social basis in terms of people coming forward, in terms of doing what Masoud was asking, in terms of diversification of the economy, there are two things. Government led or people led. You have not allowed the people to come out of the box to be innovative. So you got to allow that innovation to come through. And the only way you're going to do that is meritocracy. When we look at all these 2030s, vision 2030s that they come out with, and it's very clear saying equal opportunities for everybody. In reality, look at what's happening. I mean, some, some of them are already 15 years or 10 years down the road from the day they started with this 2030. Some of them are around four or five years. But how much of equal opportunities are coming through? Is that to Stephen's point, and I should demand this point, and to Masoud in an indirect way, that how much you're allowing people to come through? And I think somebody said it, that thinking outside the box to develop the thing, as long as you don't allow people to have critical thinking, as long as you don't allow people to be citizens, and you want to carry on having them as subjects, I don't think we're going to go forward. The good thing about this COVID, now let me look at the positive side for that part of the world. The good thing about this COVID-19, that, and I think many of his word were authoritarians, and I think I have a problem with the word authoritarian because uh, Mr. Trump said that he, ha he has total authority. And so he's a total authoritarian leader of the free world. So I would say authoritarian dictators, let me make it simpler now, okay. They have to come to realize that if they're gonna live longer, they're going to elongate the life of that, wherever it is, whether it is in Egypt, whether it is in Algeria, or wherever it is, whatever system it is, is by virtue of giving more and allowing people to be part of it, and rather than spending on arms and security to, to maintain the seat, okay, the chair, and actually I've got a good chair to sit on today, so but to maintain the chair, they should not basically spend it on arms and security, they should be spending it on the people and allowing them to come through. I think that will happen, not because they want to. I think it's gonna happen because there is no other choice. I mean, coming back to the, poor, the words of uh, Trump about, I am there for the oil. I am there to protect you to stay where you are. These things are gonna be living in the, we're gonna be utilizing this big time as people in the future. So the, the quicker, of course, this night finishes, the better. And I think Stephen's point about that part of the world, in order to get cash, unlike the developing world, unlike the developed world, unlike the so US, US can print money until kingdoms come. Uh, Europe can print money with all its problems uh, until kingdoms come. That part of the world, they cannot print money. One reason, because they are picked to the dollar. And even if they are de to the dollar, the currency is going to be totally worthless to where it is. I mean, just doing pure economic numbers now, most of the currencies in the Gulf are overvalued on average, okay, two times. I'm now being nice about the good ones and the bad ones. So it's two times over value. So it is a problematic issue that you cannot do anything. You cannot raise money, okay? You can, yes, you can go to the international market. They've just gone, three of the countries, Saudi, Qatar, and Abu Dhabi, they've gone into the international market. They've raised 24 billion, where 140 billion was the book. So it's pretty good, they can do that. But that's, is that enough? That's not enough because we are talking about substantial amount of money. The problems we're gonna have in Egypt, Algeria, and everywhere else, is gonna be so much on everybody that the Gulf, which was used, the cash, to keep some of these things quiet, is not gonna be there. The other side of it is that the war in Yemen will go away, hopefully, because there is no cash. The stupidity in Libya will go away, Somebody supporting one side, somebody supporting the other. Maybe there's six months, seven months, but that will the cash will go away. There's no cash anymore. What's going on in Syria? What's going on in other countries? Of course, we're going to have problems in places like Palestine. The people in Gaza, they're going to have problems. People in Egypt, they're going to have problems. People in Sudan, everybody's going to have a problem. So from getting out of this, certain countries are going to come out of it like 
the GCC countries, this COVID-19 from a health perspective, nor like what's happening in the rest of the world, the developed world, certain countries will be more in terms of herd immunity, simply because you cannot do anything else with it. I mean, the numbers I gave you at the beginning, it was intentional. See, and then because where you can do the test, you will find out what's going on. Most of the countries where we have so many people living and from Egypt to Morocco, tests are, when I have the numbers, the tests are so small that you cannot test. So at the end of the day, it's going to be, and as Masoud would say, you cannot in Cairo or Casablanca or whatever, keep people away from each other. Many in his point, right, it's right that people actually, as people ourselves, we in that part, and, and I was surprised to see that people, in the, and it's been taking time, it's been gradual, people actually being very careful now, staying away from all this. So everybody's been social distanced. People don't go to their parents, people don't go, because of the, the point that we raised, we are a young population in that part of the world. We're over 75% of us are the, below the age of 30. But one major problem we have, uh, we have things like obesity, we have things like blood pressure, we are, unfortunately we have things which are really bad like diabetes. So there's things which are with the elder guys. So there is a problem that people are aware that that, that can be passed to the elderly. And I see it, actually I see it in Egypt. This been, I see it in other countries. So that is the good side that people are becoming more protective of each other, over themselves and of each other. So I think post uh, COVID-19, what I would call the morning after the night before, I think initially, Melanie is right. I think authoritarianism is going to be, is going to go up big time for two reasons. Reason number one, because you've been given the chance to do that. Reason number two, because you're going to be much more scared knowing that the cash is not there. So you're going to be like we say, it's an Arabic say, it's basically because my, I got to keep everything at the end of the day for myself, I, I stay alive and I head with everybody else. So that's what's going to happen at the beginning. But I think some country is going to come out of this by allowing the people to be citizens sooner than later. And some countries, whether they like it or not, I'm talking about some regimes, whether they like it or not, the people will become citizens. Now let's hope that's not too late because the problem with that is now it comes to the European issue. The problem that the longer this takes, post the morning after the night before, the problem that the Europeans have seen in the past 10 years in terms of immigration or refugees coming up, I think at minimum is going to be quadrupled. So I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Khalid. On that, I guess, optimistic note at the end, uh, uh, we will um, uh, try to go to all the questions that have been asked um, uh, while you have been speaking. C can I um, ask uh, first uh, Abedella El Hanak? So. My question is that given the fragility of the public sector and the, and the Arab world, to what extent will the economic reforms following the uh, COVID-19 will affect the relation between states and, and, uh, and people, given the, the fact that most, most, uh, most people are employed in the public sector? Yeah, I think so that's, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll collect a few questions. I think uh, this is something that was touched on by several speakers. I have a, uh, a raised hand from uh, Ali Al Aswad. Okay, uh, just uh, Ali Al Aswad, the former Bahrain member um, in Parliament, living in London now. My first question to Mr. Stephen about uh, the labor force market. I think it's, uh, or do you think this is kind of correction to the labor force market in the Gulf now? Like we used to have too many, and now we are going back to the right number of, you know, expats where we have more, more and more, for example, starting from housemaids, workers in the construction company, uh, a security, other stuff, and going to the, ex to, to the consultants. And my second question to Mr. Khalid, Mr. Khalid. Uh, uh, Janahi, about what do you think about the reduction or deduction of, uh, from Bahraini budget for the current budget? They say 30% was announced yesterday. Do you think this will represent on the uh, projects will, which will reflect on the private sectors? We all have a concern on the private sectors now as the subsidies and the money get going from the government to the uh, 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 public sectors might be more stable than the private sectors. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, I have one more question here. Uh, Reba, did you so please? Yeah, uh, I'm a PhD candidate in the uh, Harvard Department of Government. Um, so this question is for Melanie. Um, I'm curious, especially given uh, in Lebanon and elsewhere, uh, the selective distribution of welfare on the basis of clientelism. Um, we see a lot of things like uh, poverty targeting programs, um, in Lebanon, the, the list of the most needy families was, um, has to be like totally re-audited because it's full of people from political parties. So I'm curious, like when we're doing a rapid response in this setting, how are we ba balancing um, corruption and, uh, and clientelistic distribution of services with the need to get things out quickly and get things to people quickly and maybe we don't have the bandwidth for auditing and making sure it's getting to the right people? So that's my question. Okay, can so there's one question on, on uh, clientelism and and the sort of the labor force market uh, uh, or labor markets uh, and we being sort of re readjusted, and then there is a question on the private sector, and then finally the sort of mechanism that we have for for making sure that the money reaches the right people. Maybe Melanie, do you want to start on maybe on the last question and then? Yeah, sure. Actually, I want to say something also about the first mm -hmm. question as well. Um, so maybe I'll start with that. The question about um, the possibilities for patronage and clientelism to persist in the face of declining state revenues. I mean, I think there's been a trend for, you know, at least a decade plus in declining public sector employment. In fact, we, we know this from looking at uh, public sector employment data. So this is not something that's emerged just now. There, this has been going on over time. And as, um, as Stefan uh, mentioned, this is actually a vital component of welfare regimes across the region, public sector employment. Public sector employment gets you access to all kinds of formal um, social security benefits, health access, et cetera, et cetera. So this has been posing a problem for quite some time. So one can only imagine that with this economic shock across the board, of course, hitting countries differentially depending on their reserves and so forth, um, that this problem is going to get worse and is going to have to force a change in the model of the economies in these places. Thus far, what's been going on is the expansion more of the informal sector than the formal private sector. Um, but, you know, as a number of people have documented, it's not that there's a lack of jobs in the Middle East and North Africa. There's a lack of um, good jobs. I think Zafiri Zanatos is most associated with making this argument that you know there are jobs but they aren't you know secure um uh private sector jobs in uh sufficient numbers to meet the um educated uh workforce and so forth uh, on that last question that reva posed um that's an excellent question i don't have a great answer to it i can only suspect having not seen sort of the books personally on how this is working that what your question implies is exactly what is going to happen if history is any guide. Because while the sectarian parties and networks have been extremely active in the response and have capitalized on it and have tried to sort of, you know, improve their images and, and have legitimately played an important role in the response, which is quite hybrid in Lebanon, given the um, very private and non-state nature of the welfare regime there. Um, you know, one can imagine that there is some prioritization as these networks reward hardcore supporters who have been integral to them for a long time. And it's, it's hard to say how this is playing out. This does not, I don't mean to undercut the very important work that um, technocrats, for example, in the Ministry of Public Health have been doing. Um, but, you know, the reality is that this is a hybrid regime where there is both a public sector and a non-state response to this. And it's hard to know how to regulate the allocation of benefits in that context. I'm sure that there's gonna be some preferential allocation as this rolls out. Stefan, do you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, please. So those are great questions. I think uh, on clientelism uh, through public sector employment, I, my expectation is that it will remain robust numerically. So that I don't think there will be large scale redundancies simply because there's no precedent for that in, in the MENA region. 
Um, there's been sort of a gradual erosion over time through pensioning of people, through restricted hiring, but no country's ever gone through a kind of sub-Saharan African style structural adjustment where suddenly the number of state employees drops by 50% over a few years, as you've, you've had that in some other world regions, you never had that in the Middle East, North Africa region, where that uh, sort of bedrock component of the social contract has always been protected. I think what will happen is a decline in real income uh, for public sector employees in the, in the poorer countries in the region. So uh, essentially what, what happened in Egypt. So you'll still have a fairly widely spread system of clientelism, but one that buys less for the individual clients and thereby probably will also generate a lot less political uh, support or, or even just tolerance of, of the regime. And in the medium term, I think this is also what's going to happen in uh, the fiscally more stretched GCC countries. So I think if Oman has to devalue, uh, I, I don't see it embarking on a drastic uh, fiscal updating program where it, it slims the public sector payroll by a third of the people. Instead, uh, those people's uh, income in dollar terms, in terms of what they can buy after devaluation through imported inflation, is just going to be just going to be lower. So I think generally the regime's uh, privilege breadth over depth of uh, clientelism on the on the labor market. Um, in terms of uh, the the opportunity to take the current exodus of low skilled expatriate workers as uh, an opportunity to correct the structure of labor markets in the Gulf, um, well, quite a bit of correction has actually happened already since uh, 2014. So due to lower oil prices, the uh, slowdown and in some cases severe contraction of construction sectors. Millions of people have left the region. So the total number of expatriates in Saudi Arabia uh, of expatriate workers has gone down by something like 2 million people since uh, 2015. It's picked up a little bit in 2019 with a bit more government spending, but it's, it's again going to reduce quite drastically. Um, I don't think this will fundamentally change the labor market model unless there are significant policy changes, simply because uh, employers in the region have an incentive to go for low-skilled, low-cost labor, because that's where they can exert the most arbitrage. Uh, if you hire uh, white-collar labor in the Gulf, it's as expensive as anywhere, if not more expensive. If you go for low-skilled, blue-collar labor, you really get that at a bargain basement price. So I think that unless something changes about labor admission systems, labor taxation systems, the incentive is always going to be once the economy runs again, to run on a relatively low skill, low productivity model because the labor that you can get through an essentially flat international labor supply curve is, is just very, very cheap in the low skill set. There was a question directed specifically at you. So. Uh, no, actually to, to Ali's question and to just to pick up from what Melanie and Stephen said, I think Bahrain, unfortunately for Bahrain, um, it's already a year ago started what it was called a voluntary retirement. So around 10,000 people or eight and a half thousand, 10,000 people actually went from the public sector. They basically were retired. That was part and parts of an agreement which was done with the, the three countries, Abu Dhabi, uh, Kuwait and Saudi in terms of balancing the Bahraini budget by 2022 which now is going to be far from budgeting it, uh, sort of balancing it by then. So that, that was done from that perspective, get people coming out. Now, from perspective of what's been asked about the 30% reduction, which they, uh, I think it came out yesterday or the day before yesterday. And, and unfortunately, I think that uh, we don't have the data. So the devil is in the detail. We don't know what they're going to do. It is the, clearly, it is going to be the recurrent current account side that they're going to reduce that. And that 30% actually in that amount is not that much. I mean, what they need on the stimulus side to keep this thing going and to keep the private sector going uh, is substantially much more. What they came out with a month ago, uh, 4.2 billion BD, in reality is only 500 million of that is budget related. Uh, the rest is basically banking and uh, the different elements that they came up with. So nothing to do with the real budgets from a stimulus perspective. So I think they need another another 1 billion BD in terms of, of course, depends on how long is this night. I mean, we're going to finish in six months or one year, where we're going to finish. I think they would need another minimum, another billion DNR in terms of stimulus just to keep 
that element of the private sector going and basically I would call it the helicopter cash that people will get indirectly in the system. So until we get the details, we, it's very difficult to comment on the 30% issue. Can I, can I just gonna take a, uh, another round of question. Uh, Eamon Seifenasser. Yes, uh, my name is Eamon Seifenasser. I'm uh, the chairman of health committee in uh, the Libyan parliament. Um, uh, the question, uh, I had sent it just to, to check for the oil uh, oil uh, uh, producing or exporting countries. Uh, we do know that the GCE are uh, in different situations, especially that they have reserves to survive for the coming three years. But for Libya, I believe that if we classify it as the same um, country, but uh, as the, in the same category, but uh, unfortunately, the conflicts, the internal conflicts and civil war with instabilities for more than eight years put it in, in a different uh, situation. So uh, all you know that the, um, the engine of, the, of the, these conflicts since uh, six years at least were very uh, supported by uh, regional, and, uh, regional states and other states who are interested to have some uh, who are defending the, the interests in Libya. So would the oil crisis, let me very, very, be very specific, and I, I hope that you, Eric, and also Khaled and uh, Masoud can help me in the, or, or can, can answer this question. Would that, would that crisis in prices and uh, will affect their, their, uh, their interest in, 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 in Libyan uh, or to to continue supporting either parties to con to continue this internal conflicts. Maybe there is a, a room for uh, to be optimistic in regards to the loss or the losses from the internal conflicts. We we have uh, we have many casualties and deaths, uh, especially in the last three months, uh, and more than three hundred fifty thousand uh, citizens displaced from their, their homes in Tripoli region. So this add a burden. I was in the hospital uh, a few days ago. I, I, I saw 70 injured, uh, injured young men entered the hospital in one hour, uh, plus the burden from the COVID-19, which put all the resources in, in this, uh, in this uh, or for this, re for this purpose. Um, so I, I want to know, do you have any expectation regarding the, uh, these or the behaviors of, or the, the attitudes of these regional states who are uh, energizing this internal conflicts? Would the oil crisis would have an effect on this? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ayman. Uh, I have a question from Piroshka Noj Mohachi. Very much, yes, yes, uh, Piroshka Noj Mohachi, I work for LSC Institute of Global Affairs. Uh, my question would be on a country um, uh, about which we, we don't know that much, but has been in the news, Iran. How, and then perhaps to Melanie and Stefan, but also to the other panelists, um, how you see uh, Iran has coped, not, not that much of the health crisis, which we, we heard uh, very uh, boring news, but economically, how can they handle the crisis? And what do you think the chances might be uh, for an international support, given that uh, some of the big uh, uh, global stakeholders are, um, are, are not in favor? Thank you. Okay, so, so the two questions, one which is you maybe can take also more generally of course specifically uh, to the libyan conflict and and the fact that many of the uh, involved parties will suffer economically and may not have the same resources to to get involved in in libya but of course if you can ask that question more generally do we see in other conflicts in the region uh, the covid-19 and the economic uh, fallout from that affecting um, the, the crisis, both in the sense of less resources for those uh, uh, sort of currently fueling those crises, but also, of course, the threat of, of uh, COVID-19 
uh, ravaging these kind of countries like Yemen or Syria. So, so that's the, the first question a little bit uh, elaborated by me. Um, and then, uh, you know, the second question, what, what will be the implications for Iran of what's happening and, and what, to what extent will there be a willingness internationally to, to, uh, to support I Iran uh, in the current um, context? Maybe, um, could I ask, uh, you know, possibly on, on the... Um, on the conflict side, could maybe Masoud, if you could say something about that and, and see how you see sort of opening maybe in other conflicts as well. I think on the conflict side, uh, Eric, what I would say is that uh, the lack, the cutback in resources that will come from having less oil revenues amongst countries that might be supporting different factions in the different conflicts, not just in Libya, but also in Yemen, will certainly make it harder for them to sustain the same intensity of conflict. So I would expect to see some, uh, a lower level of, of conflict, if you like. And in some cases like Yemen, you know, if you see a sort of catastrophe unfolding because of COVID-19 coming, it may even lead to some temporary agreement of uh, sort of uh, uh, truce or, or space during which people can have a ceasefire. Um, but I don't think that this will lead to eliminating the underlying uh, reasons for the conflict. And I'm less optimistic that facing this common challenge, COVID-19 and, and the oil price collapse, and, consequences thereof will lead people to rise above their uh, partisan differences, which are driving the conflicts in the region. Because I think the causes of those conflicts are not a search for oil, but they're really fueled by oil. But the, 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 the motivation for the conflicts is often uh, more sort of ideological or political. And, and I don't see that those things are going to be easily uh, changed as a result of it. And if I could, since I have the floor, make one other point on an earlier conversation, which is that I think for the oil uh, rich countries, essentially we are moving into a world where their income stream is going to go down over the next 15, 20 years from oil. And their living standards, which are currently driven by their past income streams, you know, that they've got used to a level of income and level of expenditures in households and, and societies based on a certain expectation of what their annual permanent income stream would be from oil rent. That has gone down probably to about half of what it would have, what it was. And they just have to make that adjustment. And an exchange rate is a natural tool for, for many countries to make that adjustment because it's easier to cut real incomes by depreciating your currency than it is to cut nominal incomes by actually telling public servants that we're going to cut your wages by 20% or 30%. And most countries therefore find exchange rates a good tool. I think the GC countries rather sort of fix their exchange rate. And there was a moment when they could have done that. I think Khaled is right that probably in the middle of a crisis, not the time to do it. But I would say that once the current phase of the crisis is over, not having the tool of the exchange rate as a way of dealing with the adjustment that you have to make over the next decade to a lower level of income and not preparing society for that lower level of income uh, is just postponing a difficulty that is going to come back and, and be harder to address down the road. Okay. Uh, Melanie, do you want to come in on? Um, yeah, I'll just say a couple of quick things. Um, on the conflict situation, I absolutely agree um, that this situation is driven not so much by the search for oil, but is fueled by oil. 
And we saw a couple of weeks ago that Saudi Arabia had declared a unilateral ceasefire ostensibly in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but, you know, it's possible also that fiscal concerns are driving that ceasefire as well. Um, in some of these conflicts, especially Yemen, where you've had direct military involvement of external powers, I would expect that that direct involvement will decline, but that the proxy wars are going to continue um, in, into the future. Um, and on the Iran question, you know, this is a really tough situation here. Um, Iran is an example of one of many examples of a country that had tried to hide and downplay the virus. And let me also emphasize that I'm not implying that that strategy is unique to this region. My own government actually uh, downplayed the importance of the virus and the threat that it posed initially, as did certain cable network news in the United States. Um, but, um, but Iran was doing that and arguably that exacerbated the crisis because the later you start to address it, the worse the crisis is given the exponential spread. Um, uh, economically, this is a country in crisis, in part because of the sanctions. I doubt that the United States under the Trump administration is going to want to pitch in actively and try to improve things for Iran there. Um, but there are other countries in the international arena that will probably engage more. And the last point I want to make about Iran is they actually have uh, and had for a, quite a while a pretty well-developed public health system that reached into the rural areas with health workers going out there, and that has served them well in addressing this crisis, despite the problems of the economy and the um, government uh, response initially. Stefan, you wanted to come in? Uh, yeah, just very quickly on the conflict. I, I think it's true that uh, most GCC countries had already become a little less adventurous in terms of their uh, overseas proxy conflicts. But that being said, it's, it's truer about Saudi Arabia and Yemen than it is about the UAE uh, and Libya and other places. So, I mean, uh, unfortunately, from a Libyan perspective, it's uh, the GCC countries with the biggest reserves and the longest stamina that are the most involved in Libya. So my but the initial conjecture would be that this is not going to uh, settle down completely because the GCC conflict, the intra-GCC conflict is, is unresolved. Qatar recently again stepped up uh, some of its uh, anti-Saudi activities in the context of the, the attempted acquisition of, of Newcastle Football Club. Uh, and I think that the various proxy wars and uh, uh, kind of sub-war uh, proxy conflicts in the, in the region are probably going to continue as long as the, the, the GCC conflict isn't, isn't resolved, which does look that likely right now. So as long as the conflicts are about the Newcastle Football Club, we, we should be happy, of course. Uh, Khalid, do you want to have some final word? Yeah, I think, uh, let, let me start from the Iran side. I think uh, so much has been said about the Iran fact that we're not discuss today because uh, the focus was on something which is the Middle East and we excluded Iran from the Middle East for the discussion when we talk about the Arab world. But I think the Iran issue, I, I was watching actually Bani Sadr uh, a few weeks back on BBC and uh, he was asked a question about uh, the regime in uh, Iran uh, in Qom and the regime in Washington. Uh, are they basically happy for the status quo? And his answer was pretty good, actually. He said, well, he said, both of them, they need each other to stick to each other to, to stay in power, which was an interesting thing. So what's happening is, and the reason I'm mentioning that is that what's happening that we are totally forgetting that Iran is 80 something million people. And Iran is like the rest of the Arab world from the perspective of being 80 million. But interestingly, they are more nationalistic than we are in the Arab world. The Arab world, actually, we're not nationalistic. We're very easy. I'm, I'm, maybe I, I should not be basically generalizing it, but most of us are very much at ease selling other people off for our own interests. The Iranians, I'm talking about the people in Iran, okay, they are not. They are very nationalistic, which actually gives them the fear of citizenship. So there is a big disconnect between the citizens and the Qum guys, okay, the, the power, uh, where in our part of the world, the other side is similar, but we are subjects, have power. 
So we have that disconnect. It's very important when we talk about countries that we start talking about people. I hope the morning after the night before, that becomes much more, and it's very difficult for the West to talk about people, disconnect people from the rulers. I understand how difficult it is because it affects their interests. That's what happened in 2011 and after. So, but things are changing. Uh, so Iran is very important that I think the Saudis and the rest, they, and the Iranians, they need to sit across the table with each other without the United States or Russia and everybody else. That's going to happen, not because they want to, but the powers, the regimes, they have no choice but to do so because the cash element, coming back to the issue of liquidity, is going to go dwell more and more and more as we go forward. The world at large, the morning after, the night before, is going to be less free, less open, less prosperous. In the Arab world, at least in the part of the world that uh, is the oil producing countries, we were, we were, I would say, prosperous just with the big inverted commas because people, they were living off, everybody was quiet because you could get free health, free education, free whatever, and you get an extra money to go for a couple of trips a year to whatever he wants to go to. So that kept everybody at bay. Now, what happens is that in the Arab world, like everywhere else, it's not actually the currency issue. I think the money, and Masoud's point about that people have to accept that they're gonna have less money in their pocket. I think very importantly here actually is that the regimes have to accept that they have less money in their pocket. So the Stephen's point about Abu Dhabi still carrying on and Qatar carrying on in adventure bases in Yemen, sorry, in Libya. I don't think actually in 12 months down the road that I think that will stop because if you just look at Abu Dhabi alone, the amount of resources Abu Dhabi needs to put in Abu Dhabi, not UAE, because without Abu Dhabi, the rest, the other six Emirates will be in deep, deep trouble. And there's substantial amount of resources need to be put in. I think uh, uh, Masoud alluded to it at the beginning, where he said, we have airlines, we have so many airlines that are in trouble. Actually, no bigger place with this trouble is happening except in uh, the Emirates, in Dubai, and Abu Dhabi itself. And in Dubai, which is the only place I would say, apart from Egypt, and maybe Saudi because of uh, the pilgrimage and uh, Omar, okay. The real hard currency coming in is the tourism, okay. So uh, Dubai is gonna lose that tourism for a long, long, long time to come. So you need to pump substantial amount of money. So you gotta look inwards rather than looking outwards for, for adventure. So their, their main adventure of Abu Dhabi will be inwards. And the same thing with Qatar. I mean, Qatar is a small country, there are 200,000 people. But Qatar is already in trouble because of the blockade. It already has that problem. And Qatar actually won. I, th I think this is what's going to happen. I think eventually Qatar will, did, will support, to Stephen's point, will support Oman. And will be one of the supporters of Oman, like the other three countries supported Bahrain. I think Qatar will support and Kuwait will support Oman to keep it fl at float for the next few years. However, when it comes to Libya, uh, I think it will stop. I think that will dry up whether it's six months or 12 months, I think both uh, Qatar and Abu Dhabi playing an adventurous game there, I think it's, come to, it's going to come to an end. Now, what happens to Egypt and Turkey there, that's a different matter because one lives of one, one and one was living with the other, uh, being involved there. So I think that their involvement uh, is going to be a different thing that's more political issue, more security issue, whilst the issue of Qatar and Abu Dhabi, I think is more adventurous and showing power when actually reality there is no power to show. Thank you very much. I think we have touched on a very wide range of issues and, and uh, of course uh, Masood said earlier, he spoke about the three shocks and the uncertainty and I, I, I think the uncertainty that I think all of us feel about you know, what's going to be the next phase of this pandemic I think plays out even more strongly <coughs> in the in the Middle East and, and North Africa, and and uh, this uncertainty, of course, is not only um, you know hard to live with in itself, but it's also affecting investment, affecting uh, the willingness of people to commit money to the region. So these are things that that we will have to to uh, see how they play out in in, in the region. We have spoken about the social contracts and, and them in part being reformed by default in the, in the sense that governments will not be able to support these contracts at the level that they're currently being 
supported. And of course, this is um, to some extent people will accept this, to other extent they will protest, but probably uh, you know the in, in the end they don't have much choice but to to accept uh, these uh, changes. The but what several of you have been mentioning is of course the possibility that this can be a trigger of reform or it can in some conflict zones perhaps be a trigger of, of the ceasefires and so on. So let us look at those positive uh, possibilities and, and of course as also s several of you or maybe all of you have emphasized you know the region will need to work both with each other and finding uh, with the regional institutions but also working with the European and, and hopefully also the global institutions to get through this very difficult period. We're very grateful to, to all of you for having uh, uh, engaged in this discussion and thank you to the audience for asking interesting questions and for staying with us. So thank you very much and uh, we'll definitely come back to, to this topic and this region. Thank you. Thank you.